Uh, my name is Mel Foote, and I'm the president of the Constituency for Africa. I uh, want to first welcome you all to the 2017 Brown Brown series. Uh, this is uh, the first kickoff of the week for us, and I want to uh, thank you all for coming. Um, you know, well, this is an exciting time for us in many respects. It's a, this has been the most challenging year in many respects, and, 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 and the most exciting year. Uh, one of the things that we have decided as an organization is that we ought to be focused on ourselves, you know. Uh, we can talk about what Donald Trump is going to do or what he's not going to do. We can talk about the state of affairs. But we really do have to talk about what we are going to do about it. What is, what is our, the constituency view on, um, on, on some of this? Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the people in the room here and people on the program. Uh, I'm really excited. Uh, these are the best and the brightest. You know, we have the best and the brightest minds on democracy and governance in Africa. And I disagree with most of them, I'm, I'm not, <laughs> most of the stuff, but I respect what they have to say, you know. These are the ones working in the vineyard. I want to first to introduce my chairman, Roscoe Moore, Dr. Roscoe M. Moore, Jr., and have him to stand. Roscoe, please. Um, if, I want to keep, if I want to keep my job, I better make sure I do that and do it often. But Dr. Moore is, uh, is the chairman of CFA and uh, been the chairman, I don't know how many years now, uh, but uh, he's the best person to work with. Uh, he's the smartest you ever want to get. He's uh, as nice as you ever want to have. And um, he gives you the free reign. You do your stuff, you know, and just before keep him informed. But uh, I want to thank him because a lot of stuff that happened with CFA is because of Dr. Roscoe Moore. Um, and I think I have a couple other board members. Uh, Raymond Dabney, stand up. Raymond, you're in the room. Uh, one of the board members for CFA. And uh, we've got others who are underway. But these are the people who are actually uh, drive the organization and, and make us work. I, um, I'm not going to speak why. Well, I just really wanted to, to, to extend a welcome. Ambassador Chia Mori of the AU, uh, she's on her way. And so we're going to figure out a way to make sure we accommodate her when she gets here. You know, so I just want to, um, I'm going to start off, I'm going to pass the program over to Greg Simpkins, uh, who was my friend of more than 35 years. Easy, easy. You know? <laughs> That's true, but We're easy on the years. Easy on the years. But when you look at it, you say, gee whiz, this goes back, you know. This is not a, a two-year, three-year thing. Mm -hmm. uh, we monitor the elections in Ecuador, Guinea. We've, we've been all over the place, you know, uh, in pursuit of uh, Africa. And my view with Greg has been it don't matter who's in the White House, uh, Republican or Democrat, we're friends, you know. It's always been about the knowledge. It's always been on what's going on in Africa and what we can do to improve the scenario. So uh, without further ado, uh, I'm going to turn it over to our master of ceremony, uh, Gregory Simpkins. Mind if I do it from here? Or you As you like. It? All right. Um, pleased to see you all here. Um, this is a, a very interesting topic and one that's been uh, near and dear to me for a long time. I was uh, privileged to be a part of the U.S. efforts to support democracy in Africa since the early 90s, since you already told people how long we've known each other. Um, and back then, during what we considered the wave of democracy in Africa, we had a great deal of optimism. It looked like things were changing, that, that African countries were overcoming um, the uh, uh, colonial period and, 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 and the, the misrule uh, of that time. Uh, we had uh, single party states become multi party states, like in Kenya. Uh, in Benin, one president passed uh, power peacefully after free elections to another, who then passed it back in more free elections. In Botswana, we had a president who was offered the chance to be grandfathered in and not be bound by the rules on. Uh, term limits. He refused. Uh, Nelson Mandela, as we all know, came out of 27 years in jail and, and led a multi-ethnic uh, uh, multi government that did not take reprisals, surprisingly. And so we had a lot to be hopeful for. But gradually, leaders changed. And constitutions were altered to allow people to have third terms or more. Uh, winning 90% of the vote or more uh, 
became not something to be embarrassed about as they used to be. It's something to be prideful for. But as we all know, nobody's that popular. You had um, uh, candidates who were put in jail before and after elections. In the case of Rwanda, you had a female candidate who was humiliated before the election. Uh, you have uh, situations in which um, governments tamp down on, on the media, on human rights advocates and other advocates, and pass laws that are just draconian, even more strict than colonial laws. In some cases, they used colonial laws to, to frustrate democracy. Now, today's roundtable, I think, is coming at a very critical time because we're facing a serious retrenchment in democracy and governance. And democracy, let's be clear, is more than just election day. Uh, there's a whole cycle of elections that includes uh, the, the registration of parties, the registration of voters, the registration of candidates, the delimitation of constituencies. I've seen over the years how delimitation of constituencies means you've won the election already. In Kenya, I, I refer to Kenya because I spent a lot of time there, uh, there were, for the ruling party, so many small districts and so few large districts for the opposition that even if you just won what you were expected to win, you, you already carried the day. So let me, let me stop there because Her Excellency is here. I want to give her a chance in her own building to, uh, to speak. Or do you want to? You know, CFA is thrilled to be partnering with the Africa Union to organize the 2017 Round Brown Series. We're going to do it for now. This is our home. This is our home now. You know, this is where the Round Brown Series will be centered uh, forever. But I just want to say to Ambassador Chiambori, who is the Africa Union's ambassador to Washington, um, we, we go back a long way. You know, I've known her for years, and we've crossed paths in Africa and all that. I've always saw her be dynamic. Uh, she has uh, paid her dues. She's a medical doctor, uh, uh, ran a very uh, dynamic practice in Nashville, Tennessee. So she's been to the United States for a while. But she has taken on this Africa Union job with gusto. Uh, gusto. And her vision of it uh, is diaspora is front and center. Um, you know, uh, and she's putting uh, her actions where the talk is. So it's not just talk to talk, it's walk to walk. So without further ado, I want to say thank you, my sister, for making all this happen. Uh, you are a true champion, and it's, a great, it's great for us to be partnering in an honest way with our leader, Ambassador Erikana Chiambori. Thank you, my brother Mel. Uh, I call Mel my partner in crime. Good to see you again, my brother. <laughs> I think my first serious engagement with Mel was um, several years ago. At an event in uh, South Africa, it's one of those diaspora uh, sessions uh, that was organized by the South African government. And I think uh, during the, uh, session, the summit, <coughs> it became obvious that there were quite, quite a few tensions that were arising. And it was a humongous gathering of diaspora from all over the world. We must have been over 500, right? Yeah. But anyway, um, it ended up being about eight of us that we decided that we needed to take some time out and uh, we had a weekend off. So we decided to go to Durban. And uh, during that uh, weekend, the eight of us, we strategized and as to how we're going to, this one would talk to this one and that one would talk to that one. Uh, so by the time we reconvened on Monday, we had our strategy together. And, and I have to say, we accomplished the majority of what we set out to do. <laughs> But uh, while we were gone, the rest of the diaspora who stayed in uh, Johannesburg wondered uh, where certain members of the team were. So by the time we arrived on Monday, we were labeled the Durban Eight. So it is the Durban Eight, and uh, my brother Mel, partner in crime. Uh, it's good to see you again. I'm glad uh, we, are, we were able to work together. Those stories this. are still resonating around the world. Where do those people go? <laughs> where, where do they go? Absolutely. Uh, it is indeed a pleasure to welcome all of you to the Africa House. As I've traveled uh, in this country and even in, in, uh, in Africa, I am just appalled at how people just don't know who is the African Union. So I have made it my mission to start every meeting, session, presentation by giving a five-minute brief history of the African Union. 
The first ever meeting of any African states, Union of any African states, was in 1958. This is soon after the uh, uh, French decided to liberate their colonies, so to speak. <clears throat> they gave the uh, colonies two choices. You can be uh, independent with no attachments to France, or you can be independent with uh, some attachments to France. The rest of the Francophone countries, countries elected to be independent with some linkages to France, but Guinea and Mali wanted total liberation from the uh, French people. This, of course, infuriated the uh, French, who couldn't understand why an African country would not want to be affiliated with France. So history tells us that they went in and took everything that they assumed uh, they had brought to Africa as the Frenchmen. Um, to hear Mugabe tell it, <coughs> they took the last teaspoon in the country. They even poured concrete into the sewage pipes and completely devastated the two economies. The newly appointed uh, president of uh, Ghana, Kwame Nkrumah, in his efforts to help the two economies, created the first ever known union of any African states, which was Ghana, Guinea, and Mali. To encourage the Ghanaian people and, and helping them understand why this was being done, <coughs> there was even a song that was composed. Some of you who are old enough would remember. It was Ghana, Guinea, Mali, Mali, Ghana, Guinea. But so it was the first ever known union of any African states. A few years later, a few states met in Morocco, and a few more met in uh, Addis Ababa, uh, uh, Ethiopia. By 1963, the Pan-African uh, leaders of that time decided to come together and created what was then known as the Organization of African Unity. This was in 1963. It was during this initial meeting of 34 African states that Kwame Nkrumah then declared Africa for the Africans and African Union now. He also claimed during that meeting that you're not African because you're born in Africa, but rather you're African because Africa is born in you. Those two statements were relevant then and they remain as relevant today. The African leaders have been striving to regroup and recreate what was destroyed and demarcated by the Geneva Convention of 1885. Let me take you back to February 2nd, 1835. One Englishman, after having visited Africa, was giving a presentation to the British Parliament. And I'm paraphrasing. He stated that he had traveled throughout the continent of Africa. He had seen strong-willed people, strong cultures, people of such intelligence that if we are going to destroy them, we must make sure that we destroy their religion, their self-esteem. We must make them believe that everything that is African is bad, and that which is English is best. So it was that those were the recommendations to our colonial masters. And by 1885, 50 years later, they sat down during the Geneva Convention and proceeded to cut and chop up Africa into the tiny little countries that we see today. Countries like Rwanda, Burundi, Togo, so small, there is no way those economies could survive on their own. But it was all by design. You take a country like DRC, it borders nine countries. And they were all once one humongous, strong kingdom. And the rule of divide and conquer was implemented then. And sadly, it still exists within us as black people. I often ask my fellow African diaspora and all of us black people, when you ask for the voices of the Indian diaspora, they're loud and clear. The Chinese diaspora, the Irish, the Jews, the Mexicans, they're all organized. They speak with one voice. They set out 
to accomplish something, they come together. But when you ask for the voices of the black people, you need to go to the graveyard because they silence. The question I want us as we go through this process and deliberating is to truly ask ourselves that sincere question. Why can't we come together as one, as black people? Why do we distrust each other to such an extent that we are self-destructive? $500 billion <coughs> goes to France every year from Africa. And yet we are the third world country, and France is the first world country. Every mineral that's in a francophone country, discovered yet to be discovered, oil in a francophone African country, discovered and yet to be discovered, belong to France. The francophone countries are paid royalties ranging from 12 to 15 percent a year. And you, us, the black people, we sit back and watch our Africa burn. I need all of you to take a moment and think about it. And all it takes for us to get together. We're very able people, <clears throat> extremely able. What was created during the Geneva Convention of 1885, what was designed to destroy us, must be rebuilt. But the process of rebuilding our Africa, the process of decolonizing ourselves, starts with each and every one of us taking a serious look in the mirror and having a serious conversation with that image in the mirror. I hope as we deliberate in the next three days, we can find ourselves on a journey to truly decolonize ourselves and undo what was done during the Geneva Convention in 1885. Welcome to the Africa House. Well, thank you for that uh, stirring introduction to Africa House and to the African Union. Um, I would like to invite you to give a presentation like this on Capitol Hill, because I think a lot of people who work on Africa need to hear this. Uh, we have a Congressional Africa Staff Association that I'm sure would be very much proud to have you as a, as a speaker. So on, on their behalf, although I didn't ask them, on their behalf, I, th I would like to invite you to do that. Left. Okay, very good. So, um, we will call to the podium our, our speakers. Um, this morning we're very uh, honored to have um, people who have um, great experience in Africa, some of whom I've worked with for a long time, like Dave Peterson. I'm not going to tell Dave, tell how long we've worked together because I don't want to embarrass him. Yeah, yeah, let's leave it at a long time. Um, uh, Dave has been with the Senior Director of the Africa Program at the National Endowment for Democracy almost since it began. Um, he, in fact, was a, um, a witness last week at our hearing on Liberia. Another one of the witnesses last week at our hearing uh, on Liberia was Rushdi uh, Nakherdian from the uh, from IFAS, Regional Director for Africa for the International Foundation for Electoral Systems. And he, he is a go-to person. Even if we have to go to him late in the process, we always know that he will give us a good presentation because he's very well versed on the election systems on, on the continent. Uh, Dr. Raymond Gilpin, who's Dean of Academic Affairs at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies, is, is someone who has significant expertise on Africa policy. And you know we're very happy to, to have him with us. And last but certainly not least is Dr. Mena Demesi, Vice President of Policy and Research for the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. Um, many people perhaps um, don't realize how int uh, intricately the African 
um, American members of the caucus have been involved in Africa policy since the days of uh, our Angola policy, in fact. Uh, they were very critical in, in putting that together in the 1970s. So uh, if our speakers would uh, please come to the stage, uh, we will begin our, our presentations. So now I'd like to uh, begin our presentations with, with Dave Peterson of NAEP. Oh, uh, thank you, Greg, and uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, it's really an honor to be able to um, kick off this morning's program. So uh, the role of the diaspora in promoting democracy and good governance in Africa. At the National Endowment for Democracy, uh, we've long recognized the important role the diaspora plays in the promotion of democracy and good governance in Africa. Although our emphasis with our small grant program has been on supporting indigenous African civil society organizations rather than the work of American-based organizations, from time to time we have supported African diaspora groups uh, to conduct programs. Our public meetings at the endowment have also always tried to reach out to the diaspora. Many members of our Africa program team, as well as other NED departments, such as our finance grants, World Movement for Democracy, and fellowship programs, uh, have also tapped the African diaspora. They typically bring a greater depth of knowledge about the politics of Africa, as well as assets such as language ability and passion uh, that have been invaluable to our program. <clears throat> I know this is the same with the endowment sister organizations, NDI, IRI, uh, the Solidarity Center and the Center for National uh, Private Enterprise, as well as organizations such as uh, IFAS and uh, U.S. Institute of Peace and Open Society Foundations and USAID. Uh, beyond our institutions, of course, the African uh, diaspora is active in a host of fronts uh, from lobbying Congress and the State Department to raising funds for all kinds of political activity back in Africa. But upon reflection, this issue is more complicated than it might seem. For example, in terms of NED support to diaspora organizations, this has usually occurred when they have something to offer that African-based organizations do not, such as when uh, capacity in Africa is low or the political repression is high. It can often be very sensitive politically, such as in the case of Ethiopia. Many of you are uh, probably, I'm going to talk about some examples. Um, the um, uh, Ethiopian Community Development Center, ECDC, <clears throat> uh, we supported years ago uh, to uh, conduct uh, research in civic education after the fall of the DERD. Um, all of the grants that the endowment makes are uh, public information, so uh, I'm not saying anything that is in any way um, a secret. Yet uh, ECDC had uh, great difficulty in sustaining that project in Ethiopia. A similar diaspora effort, the Ethiopian Red Terror Documentation and Research Center, was also forced to shut down. These were worthy efforts and not confrontational with the government, but were nevertheless deemed undesirable. <clears throat> as we all know, as uh, the ambassador alluded, the divisions that exist uh, back in Africa can often be found in the diaspora community abroad. In meetings we've held at the endowment on Ethiopia, uh, for example, as well as many other African countries I can recall, uh, such as uh, Congo or uh, Eritrea, Zimbabwe, Nigeria, these debates have often been pretty lively. In the case of Eritrea in particular, the political environment has been so close that we've been compelled to uh, support diaspora organizations exclusively instead of organizations based inside the country as, as we prefer. Um, we've supported uh, diaspora-based radio programs uh, or increasingly websites uh, that provide information that's unavailable in closed media environments. We try to be careful that such programs are objective and fact-based rather than partisan. In the case of Equatorial Guinea, uh, we've uh, supported the diaspora group EG Justice, uh, which has done some excellent work in expanding political space in that very difficult country. A few years, a few years ago, uh, 
uh, we met with some Gambian diaspora representatives who were seeking support. Not long afterwards, uh, those same individuals attempted a coup. Ned does not support regime change, only democratic strengthening and reform. Fortunately, Gambia now seems to be on the right course, and I know members of the Gambian diaspora have been very supportive uh, to the new democracy in the Gambia. But I think the point is that, you know, when we're talking about diaspora support for democracy, uh, sometimes I think there is a concern that, uh, you know, that there's a criticism that uh, we or other organizations are interfering in the sovereignty of, of uh, states, meddling in the politics, uh, whether it's by supporting diaspora or uh, indigenous political groups. And so it's just uh, something I wanted to highlight. Uh, another good example of, thing, of this is the case of Nigeria. And uh, Mel would be very familiar uh, with uh, uh, our activity uh, uh, back during the uh, Abacha dictatorship in Nigeria. Uh, at the time, uh, the endowment supported a couple organizations, uh, one called NADECO, the Nigerian Democratic Coalition, another called the uh, Movement for the Survival of the Agoni People, MOSOP. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with these organizations. <clears throat> uh, we supported them through their diaspora representatives that were based in London. Of course, the Nigerian government at the time was not pleased uh, with our support for these groups. We came under a lot of pressure. Uh, to stop our support. Few other donors would touch them. Uh, but uh, when Abacha died and the uh, democratic transition occurred in Nigeria, many members of these organizations, uh, including the exiles, uh, became prominent members of the new government. And uh, we felt vindicated by that. A couple other uh, of my favorite examples of uh, diaspora uh, organizations that are working for democracy in Africa uh, are uh, one, the uh, Cush Community Relief International uh, that was based in Nebraska uh, and did uh, some great work uh, during the CPA in uh, Sudan. Um, <clears throat> another one is the U.S. Africa Leadership and Government Academy, uh, uh, USLGA, uh, which is a Texas-based uh, organization that's building uh, local government capacity in the Kasai provinces of Congo. Uh, these groups have not uh, been in opposition to the government, uh, but have clearly sought to strengthen the political leadership of those countries. Unfortunately, many African political activists have found themselves forced into exile. And from time to time, Ned has been able to help them continue their efforts on behalf of democracy and human rights, whether from the U.S. or sometimes based in uh, England or France or even closer to home, such as the South Sudanese who've taken refuge in uh, Uganda. Too often, such political activists who have been forced to join the diaspora have great difficulty just surviving abroad, let alone continuing their political work. And at the endowment, we've been trying to come up with ways to keep such talented activists involved, uh, such as our Emergency Fellows Program. Last week, I testified at uh, the congressional hearings on the upcoming elections in Liberia. And uh, uh, I was on a, a panel that included an American Liberian activist from Staten Island. Uh, the Liberian community in Staten Island is evidently a force to be reckoned with. Uh, and her congressman was very attentive to the concerns she raised. My impression is that the Liberian diaspora in the US has been especially active in supporting democracy, whether by lobbying Congress for aid to Liberia or in supplying technocrats to serve in various positions in the reconstruction of the country, or providing direct assistance uh, to various causes. At NED, uh, we supported uh, some American-based Liberian journalists, uh, oh, uh, yeah, some American-based Liberian journalists who have advocated for greater press freedom back in Liberia. But we also know that during the Civil War, Charles Taylor was getting some support from the African diaspora. Certain other conflict situations in Africa, such as Somalia, uh, may have been exacerbated by members of the diaspora. On the other hand, I know that members of the Somali diaspora have also played a vital role in rebuilding a democratic Somaliland, uh, some of whom uh, we were proud to support in their endeavor. <clears throat> I must acknowledge that the modest resources we've been able to provide are a drop in the bucket 
of the many initiatives that the African diaspora has engaged in support of de democracy. But I said, as I said at the outset, it's complicated. The diaspora can be a force for democracy and for peace, but it can also support conflict and misinformation. This should not be surprising. What is very clear, though, is that for those of us that are concerned about democracy, especially in Africa, but around the world for that matter, we need to listen to and work with the diaspora more uh, to take advantage of their talents and to support their dreams and efforts for a world that is more free and democratic. Uh, we're all in this together. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. You know, there's almost 10 minutes exactly. Oh, good. Very good. Uh, Dr. Gilbert. Make sure I get this right. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Greg. Uh, and uh, Madam Ambassador, uh, Dr. Roscoe Moore, uh, Mel Foote, and uh, all the great folk of the CFA, uh, thank you so much for organizing what I think is a timely and um, very, very, very uh, important conversation about the role of the diaspora in um, governance and democracy in Africa. Um, this is a fraught topic. It's not as easy as it sounds, uh, which is why I really um, um, appreciate um, you, uh, Mel, making this the lead off for this year's uh, Mel Foot conversation. Because I think, as you said earlier, we need to take a really long, hard look inside. Um, if it were an easy problem, it would have been solved a long time ago. But um, since I'm uh, from a university, I'm going to start with definitions and a few challenging questions. Um, uh, the first um, relates to the whole concept of the diaspora. Um, diaspora comes from a Greek word, which, ba which basically means the scattering. And um, there's a seminal work by um, Dr. Joseph Harris at Howard University in 1983, which talks about the four circulatory phases of the diaspora. And that's important because generally when we talk about the diaspora, in our minds, it's as though we are talking about a monolith. There's one group called the diaspora. It's come, according to um, Dr. Harris, in four waves. And I would contend that since then there has been another wave, uh, a fifth wave of, demo of, um, of the diaspora. So what, is, what does this mean? I think, to me, it suggests that when we're thinking about what the diaspora could do or should do to support and promote democracy across the African continent, we have to be thinking in a more varied manner. There are certain things that you know, newer members of the diaspora can do that older members of the diaspora cannot do. There are some things that the second wave can do because they have a lot more contacts and context in countries like the United States that the newer cannot do. So as we think through democracy and governance in Africa, I'd like us to just bear in mind that we're dealing with a slightly more complex um, set of uh, players here. Last week um, in Athens, um, Kofi Annan gave a speech um, which he titled The Crisis of Democracy. He was part of the 2017 Athens Democracy Forum. And he articulated three pillars of healthy um, democracies. And I'd like to use those three pillars as the context for what I think um, the diaspora, as variegated as it is, could and should be doing. And the, the three pillars that he identified are sustainable and equitable development, promotion of the rule of law, and respect for human rights. Um, quite often when we think about what the diaspora could do to promote governance, and again, I think um, CFA got it right, it's governance, not governing. Generally, we see a lot of people in the diaspora cashing their 401k, getting massive debts, and running for office. And uh, that's one thing, but it's not the only thing that could be done. And there's a problem with that as well, because when somebody has cashed in their 401k, 
and gotten huge debts, the average cost of running for office in Africa now is in the millions in US dollar terms. That person automatically becomes beholden to a perverse political economy. It becomes existential because the retirement funds have gone into the elections. And then you naturally see those people getting into the system and extracting from the system to replenish. So which is why I think the three pillars that uh, Kofi Annan articulated are a lot, e a lot better. What about equitable and sustainable development? I think there are three things that um, the diaspora could do. First, we need to promote trade. We need to promote free and fair trade in Africa. The ambassador was right that um, significant resources flow out of Africa, both legitimately, the uh, 500 um, million that you mentioned, you know, that's legitimate. But the illegitimate flows because of unfair trade are significant. And so there are a lot of things that we can do, particularly waves two and three of the um, circulatory phase, people who are already in, entrenched in um, non-African um, political systems. We could move and we could advocate for trade relationships that allow Africa and Africans to benefit from the wealth of not just mineral, but also agricultural, human, and physical resources that, with which the continent is endowed. Second, we have to focus on jobs. Um, we um, talk a lot about it, but in our, um, in our engagements with the continent, as we, as, as we advise on investments, as we participate in investment, I think an important thing always has to be how does this translate into jobs? Because I have traveled across the continent over the last God knows how many decades. The average African does not really want a handout, wants to work. So how do we ensure that there are jobs? And when we um, invest ourselves, when we are part of investment um, outreaches, we have to make sure that jobs and the third thing, productivity, is important. Way too much of the beneficial side of the value chain of what Africa produces resides outside the continent. It's not impossible to bring most of it back in. Botswana did it recently by legislating that you know, some of the cutting of diamonds should happen in Botswana. And once you start having a, more, a healthier economic ecosystem, we start seeing that pillar of democracy with people who have a stake in the democratic process. Not expectations of extraction, but a stake in the democratic process being more active and productive players. Second thing is the rule of law. Um, impunity is a problem across the continent and it corrodes the political system. We have to, we don't need new laws. There are great laws on the books across the African continent. But the diaspora could play a great part in ensuring that we have um, where there needs to be reform of the legal system and legal institutions, that people who have the wherewithal and who have the skill sets make themselves available. Because at the end of the day, when there are legal issues relating to the democratic process, not democratic events, the democratic process, you do need a system, a rule of law system, that is not just re resilient, but is appropriate in an African context. And no one knows it as well as people who have that connection to the African continent, i.e. the diaspora. Last, and I'll round up very soon, is, um, human rights. Um, uh, you know, with impunity comes this problem of um, human rights abuses and violations, exclusion, etc. cetera. Um, the diaspora needs to be not just the ethical leadership for human rights, but also the moral conscience. Um, quite often, the diaspora, as um, my fellow panelists just uh, mentioned, is no more than a microcosm 
of all the problems, all the tensions, all the divisions that do exist. And one great thing about um, events like this is after the diaspora, i.e. the scattering, we need to come together and bring with us the best of our experience, the best of our intellects, and the best of our foresight. In 2050, 25% of the people on the planet will be African. I may not be here in 2050, but a lot of people would be. But what sort of Africa are we, do we anticipate? And how do we ensure that we have systems where there is inclusivity in politics, that people's rights are not just acknowledged, but are respected across the board? If we have the economic side, we have rule of law, we have respect for human rights, then we start seeing governance taking hold and democracy being a lot more than an event. Because the role that the diaspora could play is not assuming political office exclusively, but it's in sowing the seeds, laying the foundations that would ensure that in 2050, we have systems that are resilient, that are accountable to the people, and that protect the rights and ensure the human security of every African citizen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Demessi. Thank you. Um, first, I also want to echo what's been said already and thank uh, CFA, Melfoot, uh, Greg Simpkins, uh, fellow distinguished panelists, and Her Excellency for your comments, which resonate strongly with me. And uh, I think uh, for the nature of this conversation, not only am I think it's important to mention I'm not only speaking in my capacity as uh, Vice President of Policy Analysis at the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, but as someone who does identify, um, even though born and raised in Cleveland and a proud Clevelander, uh, mm -hmm. am the child of Ethiopian immigrants. Um, I. Uh, grew up with a conscious for Africa, um, primarily because my parents uh, made sure that that was the case. And so uh, I wear some other hats that, um, to the point of this conversation, I think are uh, not only relevant, but important to state to um, doctors. Um, Raymond's comments about the multiple diasporas uh, that um, are present, we also share multiple identities. And I, for the past 25 years, have been part of the Society of Ethiopians established in the diaspora, one of the longest standing nonprofits right here in DC. I literally grew up in that organization. Um, and uh, we have had our sort of trials and tribulations over the years adapting to sort of um, westernized notions of mobilizing community uh, when many of our supporters and members uh, were people who shared two identities. And so uh, that has been uh, very uh, much of a learning experience. And in fact, I think uh, it's nice to sort of meet Greg again in this capacity. I was talking to him earlier, and I first met him as a graduate student myself at the University of Michigan, um, where in 2005, 25 uh, researchers, uh, graduate students and faculty from the University of Michigan went to Ethiopia. Uh, three weeks prior to the 2005 election, and if you go way back when, you will remember that uh, there was uh, um, excitement around um, uh, engagement and um, of the electoral process. And upon our return three weeks later, the elections happened, and uh, in one of the sort of um, deemed modernized democracies or emerging democracies on the continent, you saw a violent outbreak um, and killings take place. And it was a big wake-up call for us. So that group of 25, we returned to uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan, wrote a 126-page report um, on government folks we talked to, reporters who were talking about uh, lack of freedom of press. Um, we talked with government ministry officials, and we took those results uh, and sent it to Capitol Hill. 
Um, and so in my personal capacity, while I was doing my uh, dissertation, uh, in which my advisors told me that doing a dissertation on the African um, uh, population in the U.S. would be difficult because Africans are statistically insignificant in the, in the United States, I had two challenges um, at the time. One was to um, be that much more <laughs> encouraged and inspired to make sure my dissertation was exactly on that topic, and it was. Um, and I, uh, at the same time, to con to be conscious of myself as a citizen of the United States, as someone who is engaged in diaspora mobilization. And so um, it was serendipitous at the time that we went to Ethiopia, created this report, and uh, on, you know, my way to the United States or to DC, a nation's capital, to conduct my interviews, I ran into um, uh, Greg Simpkins, learned that the Congressional African Staff Association, which he recently, he just mentioned, um, was created back then. Uh, and I quickly learned that African uh, Africans and diaspora here in the United States uh, are in fact moving in various ways. Um, I was uh, surprised to find that many of my fellow African diaspora sisters and brothers were in strategic positions um, on Capitol Hill working uh, for members of Congress. Many of you probably know Angel Cuomo, who is no stranger to those of us who've been on the Hill. Um, she was one of the founders of the Congressional African uh, uh, staff association. So at the same time that I was trying to convince my advisors that we mattered, um, I had lived experiences and, um, uh, and, and people uh, that I incorporated into my research to say we are here, we are visible, and look at the ways in which um, organizations like uh, CASA and, and others like Greg Simpkins who are committed to development and democracy on the continent and mobilizing here are active and are active in ways that are um, transforming uh, members' commitments, members of Congress's commitment to these issues. Um, and then we were in LA where um, in my personal capacity, uh, a lot of the Ethiopian diaspora were mobilizing around um, the, the outbreak that happened. And uh, we had a huge forum out there to talk about what we could do. And so um, for me, uh, this is critical not only in terms of you know, providing research and data, but really showcasing models of mobilization that work and to suggest that there is not one way uh, to promote democracy on the continent, uh, but several different ways. And I think it's important to lift up those models when talking about um, you know, what's not happening. Let's see what is happening and what's working. So um, I have four points to make uh, in regards to the topic for discussion today, democracy beyond elections, leveraging power of African youth, empowering civil society, and uh, building and sustaining global partnerships. Before I get to that, let me just explain to those of you who might, who are familiar with the Congressional Black Caucus established in 1971, um, now home to the largest uh, number of black members of Congress ever in US history, 49 in the 115th Congress. That was also the case last, uh, last session of Congress, so we've grown a little bit. Um, but the CBCF uh, was the nonprofit that the, uh, is created in 1976 that was established by the Congressional Black Caucus. And so, um, as uh, Greg alluded to earlier, uh, there was much of a concerted effort, as we all know in this room in the 70s, uh, from Diggs delegation to uh, Ghana, uh, to uh, Congressman uh, Dellums, uh, co-founder of the CBC and his uh, sustained efforts uh, over 10, 15 years to help pass the Comprehensive Anti-Apartheid Act that passed in 1986. And you don't often hear of the ways in which black members of Congress were critical in the liberation in Africa. Oftentimes, it's narrated as if there was a, somewhat of an epiphany that the US had, and all of a sudden, we passed this bill. But there were soldiers and um, people behind the scenes uh, against the grain of racial di discrimination uh, in this country that were vigorously fighting other ba battles of black liberation on the continent. and the CB has been critical in that respect. Um, so uh, to my quick points, uh, democracy beyond election. So you might remember maybe five, 10 years ago, some of the verbiage used around Africa rising. And I find that to be um, an interesting phrase because for those of us engaged with the continent, it's always been rising. Maybe we just realized that it was rising. And so um, I think uh, that comment is more uh, indicative of uh, the US's realization that um, uh, 
we, we need to kind of push a more strategic approach of engagement to the continent, right? And so great effort has been made with that regard. We see the establishment of the MDG goals. We have uh, entities like NED and IRI, NDI, and other international observers, certainly the Africa Union that has been uh, a leader in that space in terms of promoting democracy abroad. Um, what in, I've come to, to find out and have learned from my uh, colleagues uh, is that we ha are in a space where democracy has been limited to that of election. So Greg talked about sort of the processes of registration, canvassing, and all that, that go into the election. I'd like to expand that um, ideology to think about the you know, democracy as it relates to the pre- and post-election period. So uh, when we focus on elections which are critically important, uh, a lot of the outcomes have to do with what was happening the past two, three, four years or until the, you know, back till the previous election, right? And so when you uh, think about education uh, in terms of um, voter, uh, voter sort of knowledge of, uh, of what's going on or government's efforts to include the people or build trust, these are things that don't just happen on election day or that you would measure on election day. Um, so um, sort of I, those of us in this space have to continue that push to expand um, our measurements of effective democracy beyond elections. And I think, you know, that's uh, critically important and in, 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 it involves and requires an effort to uh, to really think about changing the mindset around that, right? And so uh, I'm reminded of an op-ed piece that Professor Claude Kambemba wrote, and he says, quote, in most African countries, elections are a solution to the problem of political legitimacy, but they do not provide answers to problems of state malfunction. The mere establishment of electoral dem democratic processes has not been sufficient to ensure that an elected government is democratic or will remain democratic over time. Time. And so that requires us to take a deep look at the ways in which partnerships, funding, uh, engagement with the citizenry, what is happening pre and post election that, that provides us with some kind of uh, idea of how we might critique or analyze an election outcome. Dave and I were in Kenya a few weeks ago for, uh, for their election, um, and it was an amazing experience to see the hours upon hours committed by the Kenyan people to make sure this was an effective election. Um, and it uh, certainly raised eyebrows about what we could even do better here in the United States. Um, but that being said, when you think about, um, you know, this sort of outcome that we are all uh, watching closely and the world is watching closely, uh, you know, it's important to go back and say, well, well, what was what was the education learning curve like for the IEBC? What was that process like when they went to those 290 constituencies and trained? You know, what what were the gaps there? What did do some of the international observers do pre-engagement in that period to ensure that things would go well or perhaps not so well? So I, I just want to raise that. Um, I, I, that to the forefront. Um, my second point is leveraging power of African youth. Um, we know uh, that uh, according to the UN by 2030, projected youth in Africa will increase by 42 percent. Uh, Africa's youth population is expected to also continue to grow throughout the remainder of the 21st century, um, more than doubling from current levels by uh, 2055. And so you cannot talk about democratic governance in Africa without talking about how we're engaging young people. Young people in a globalized economy that are, um, you know, giving talking uh, points from a computer like this as opposed to a notepad and what that means for engaging in real time with other communities abroad, other diaspora communities um, uh, here. Uh, I think that is critically important. How are we engaging and meeting millennials even where they are? Um, I read some of the court proceedings or the policy proceedings from last year's CFA and uh, programs like YALI were lifted up in that report, which I think is a great example. It's only one example of many, but it's an important one um, that needs to be expanded and we should not rely on just the government to continue that kind of engagement with uh, young African um, leaders uh, who are committed uh, to uh, staying uh, the course and um, promoting democracy in the ver various facets that uh, they're involved in, from medicine to, um, to engaging young people to um, encouraging education among women, um, you name it. So those are 
important point uh, to not dismiss um, youth, but to use it as a tool for um, uh, leveraging a more committed focus because of that bridge. Um, empowering civil society organizations as a conduit for change. Uh, many of you may have looked at the recent Brookings report uh, on their recommendations for Africa, and I was taken by one of their statements that civil society organizations must stop being limited to watchdog rule, and government must see and work with them as allies. Uh, we can lift Ethiopia up in this case. It's one of the few, I believe, if not only countries that has a, a, a sort of a regulation for uh, funding, uh, I think beyond 10% that it comes from a foreign entity can operate a CSO in the country. And so uh, again, what does that say for trust in government and the ability of governments to recognize that um, you know, you have to have the trust of the people and the engagement of the people. And when you have these CSOs on the ground, those are models right there. Uh, oftentimes we think about reinventing the wheel. There are people making change as we speak. Let's lift those up and the government, uh, you know, should be, play a critical role in supporting them as opposed to treating them as enemies of the state, if you will. Um, and uh, finally, uh, building sustaining, uh, sustainable global partnerships that prioritize the African diaspora. I will uh, admit that I'm a little biased in this regard. Um, as I mentioned, you know, I'm, I'm uh, you know, a Midwestern born committed person, but I also consider myself as part of the, the larger African diaspora. And a lot of us that have been in the circles of Capitol Hill, members who have, uh, staff who've come through, and uh, this will be my last point through CASA and beyond, uh, you know, recognize that even in this country, in order to affect change there, we've got to make our um, diaspora visible here. Um, there, as you know, our numbers have been drastically underestimated over time, but if you, we have a, about in North America, perhaps close to 40 million uh, a diaspora, sort of first, second generation that are in this country operating um, and, and visible and active. And we want to see our faces um, uh, in positions like the work that Mel Foote has done to create this platform to hear from uh, those of us who come from these spaces. And so it is important that when these conversations happen where you have partners in the international space, uh, you know, diaspora people should be lifted up in that conversation while you're talking about the diaspora. And so um, I think it's important to, uh, to keep that in mind as we move forward. And of course, uh, it was great to hear the AU proclaim the sixth region of, of um, you know, committed to sort of the African diaspora space. Uh, former Secretary Clinton made uh, some waves in uh, sort of symbolizing the significance of the diaspora. Uh, it is unclear whether you know, that commitment from state uh, will, co you know, will continue, but uh, nonetheless, we, you know, we've got a third of the African foreign-born population in, in almost four states, New York, California, Texas, Maryland, uh, you know, we're, in DC, home to the largest population of Ethiopians outside of Ethiopia, I keep telling these taxi drivers, do you know how much power you have if you were to come together and just decide not to drive and boycott one day for something you really want? It would be on the front page of the newspaper. You know, um, and, and, but but realizing that power uh, in terms of geo even at the level of geographical proximity to nation's capital is critical. You go to any Africa subcommittee hearing um, on Africa, you know, you've got the community right here in the District of Columbia that can show up and do show up sometimes, right? But this, going back to your point, Your Excellency, about organizing and what that looks like, it's important to sort of meet people where they are, lift models up that are, are working, and, and also understand our power uh, right here, uh, you know, and, and, and sort of think about us in that capacity. So those are my points, democracy beyond elections, how do we change that mentality, leveraging the power of African youth, what does that look like, like building on a YALI uh, model, empowering civil society, and building sustainable global partnerships, um, and we can start uh, right here with CFA, so I'll start there. Thank you. And certainly last but not least, Rusty. Madam Ambassador, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen, um, I take extreme pleasure in addressing this forum today. Uh, on behalf of the International Foundation for Election Systems, uh, allow me to express my gratitude 
uh, for being here. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the role of elections as a very critical entry point into this conversation about democracy and governance. During any given year on the African continent, we, we see between 10 to 25 major elections taking place. Elections today since the rise of multipartyism and the end of the Cold War are common rituals for African voters. Evidence of this re democratic ritual show up in long queues of snaking voters featuring on the cover pages of newspapers and the television, um, along with inked fingers or voters' cards flashed very proudly. Survey after survey demonstrate that Africans prefer democracy over other political systems and that elections are the preferred method of choosing their leaders. Nearly 87% of sub-Saharan Africans' eligible population is registered to vote. Over 45 million ballots were cast in the region in 2014 alone. And a recent Afrobarometer publication based on more than 51,000 face-to-face interviews in 36 countries reveals that the demand for democracy in Africa exceeds the supply. Ladies and gentlemen, while we talk about elections in very broad strokes, it's also important to recognize the critical role that elections play in the psyche of the voter. Going to the polling station, the voter encounters a unique experience for some. An election that represents a public service rolled out on a massive scale that needs to work almost identically from location to location, spread out across the entire country and abroad on a single day. Take Nigeria as an example. Being the most populated country on the continent with 186 million citizens, the Independent National Election Commission employs more than 12,000 permanent staff at its headquarters and state levels to manage the many responsibles before and during elections. Before the recent 2015 poll, they were responsible for registering and verifying more than 68 million citizens procuring and preparing equipment for 120,000 polling stations, designing and distributing localized ballots for more than f with more than 7,000 candidates that contested various offices, and recruiting and training more than 700,000 temporary staff to work on election day. Those are astounding figures. That means that every voter in Nigeria who, f who first had to be registered and then turn up to vote engage with the elections machinery at least twice, sometimes three times, if they needed to collect their permanent voter cards after registration. In doing so, they encountered the face of an election commission on a scale seldom experienced by any other form of public service. Voters' views of election, as much as through the media and politicians, are shaped by these personal, individual experiences in polling stations across the land. Afrobarometer long-standing public opinion survey has long seen that voters themselves are quite accurate assessors of the quality of elections, as much as election observers in many, almost all cases. While on average 65% of African voters feel that their elections are free and fair, the perception of trust with which they approach the election commission lags. On average, 50% of voters trust the election commission somewhat or a lot. And surveys show that voters feel less confident about the fair counting of their votes, an average of 34% across 36 countries than any other part of the electoral process. This shows some weaknesses in the system, where voters feel positive about the process overall, less so about the institution, and even less so about the core part of the process, the counting. This means more must be done to strengthen not only the electoral institutions as public in entities, but also the counting and the results processes associated with voting. IFAS believes that the legitimacy of an elect election and public confidence in the resulting structures of democratic governance largely depend on the actual and perceived integrity of the electoral process. If citizens and candidates believe an election was unfair or poorly administered, they may not accept the outcome. And therein lies the, lies the starting point for many uh, uh, democracy and governance processes. While elections have become common in Africa, what has also become common is accompanying violence. It's estimated that 60% of all election, African elections encounter some form of election-related violence. This violence 
while having a low or no impact on voter turnout does mean that elections are faced with an element of fear rather than celebration. In 2015, Nigerians went to vote under the threat of Boko Haram attacks on polling stations. This resulted in restrictions on travel on election day, and the capital Abuja was a dead city with deserted streets and security forces prevalent on every major intersection. The recent August elections in Kenya saw many voters self-displace to their rural homesteads and villages out of fear that the post-2007 elections violence might repeat itself. Voters are now making calculated decisions well ahead of polling day to vote early to vote to avoid any prospects of violence or registering and voting well away from the major urban centers where they perceive the threat of violence to be heavier, higher. The winner-take-all mentality that dominates African elections places pressure not only on the electoral institutions, but also ordinary voters who fear political violence linked to the elections. It strains the security infrastructure in a country when it comes to prospects of violence flowing from violent extremist groups, such as across the Sahel, or supporters of rival political parties who choose violence on the streets to voice their demands during campaigns or during the aftermath of results announcements. Voting needs to be seen and felt as an opportunity for democratic renewal. We need to safeguard our elections to ensure that voters can cast their votes without fear of intimidation, without the air of threat hanging over our cities. This brings me to another common element of African elections, namely falling participation. Over the last 25 years, the average global voter turnout has dropped more than 10%. Voter turnout in Africa has fallen to well before 1990 turnout levels, declining consistently since 2000. This is particularly problematic in Africa with its growing population of young voters that other panelists have referred to. Research shows that if first-time voters have not participated in their first three elections, prospects for further participation falls to zero. Participation in African elections represents an important check on democracy's health, and with a growing youth bulge, increasing the participation in democratic elections represents a challenge for every single African country to analyze, understand, and creatively address. What could be done to improve this? Administering elections on non-working days or designating an election day a public holiday, locating polling stations in populated places and increasing their number, using op automating process for both voting or registration. Importantly for this forum, allowing and promoting voting from abroad, eliminating all other obstacles that make it difficult to vote. When it comes to voters abroad, more than half of African countries, 28 to be exact, allow for participation from the diaspora in, the, in their presidential elections, 24 in parliamentary elections. Though an expensive in logistical endeavor, often limited to embassies or foreign missions, this represents a universal right that many countries extend to voters abroad. Diaspora voting is a key element of nation building, especially in fractured environments such as Somalia and South Sudan that have seen many displacements due to in-country violence. In addition to its symbolic value, the vote as a fundamental expression of democracy has become a means of reaffirming and reinforcing citizenship. This has stimulated diasporas to continue participating in democratic life of their countries from abroad. The issue of overseas constituency seats is yet to feature high on Anglophone countries' agendas. Countries like Algeria, Mozambique, Angola, and Cape Verde all recognize the diaspora vote as being important enough to include in their parliamentary representation with reserved seats more such forward-leaning provisions are needed across African countries. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to work on strengthening our elections, starting with our election management bodies as national assets and custodians of the process. We need to strengthen the quality of our elections so that voters trust their vote will be counted as cost and develop an integrity, um, faith in the integrity of the process. We need to secure and safeguard our polling stations to not use um, to de and develop a greater sense of tolerance amongst political rivals, to not use violence during the uh, election campaign, election um, day, or following the announcement of results. With greater threats emerging to democracy in the form of extremist groups, this challenge must be headed up front more than ever. 
And lastly, we need to understand and address the factors leading to falling turnout at the polls. The vibrancy of African democracies depends on our participation, whether from first-time young voters from abroad or us as citizens in the diaspora. Let us work together to ensure that we invest in these elements to consolidate our democracies. I thank you. So you've, you've heard some very in-depth presentations here this morning, but before we get to questions and answers, I want you to take some time to think about what you want to ask. Uh, but before we go on a, on a break, I'd like to ask Professor Kingsley Chiedu Mughala to come forward. He's the founder and CEO of Sogato Strategies, a boutique risk advisory consulting firm providing services to the world's leading private equity and asset management firms. He's the former deputy governor of the Nigerian Central Bank and formerly served as a member of the redesign panel uh, on the UN Interna internal justice system and also worked for the UN in New York, in Cambodia, Croatia, Tanzania. Uh, I'd like him to give us a reaction to give you some further thoughts uh, on what you want to discuss when we come back. Yeah. Um, this is on? Yeah. Yes. Very good. Okay, good. Um, good morning. Good morning. Ambassador Chiambari, my dear friend and sister, good to see you again. Good morning. Um, Mel Foote, Mr. Sim Simpson, so Simpkin, sorry. Yeah. Distinguished panelists, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I think we've had, I just want to give a few reactions to what we've heard this morning um, and to share some thoughts of my own, uh, all within five or six minutes, I hope. Um, we've had a very rich discussion. Democracy is Africa's future. When we look at Africa 2063, the vision that Africa, the African Union, is, is coming up with for Africa. Uh, a very ambitious vi vision, very realizable vision, I would say. And I think what we need to do to achieve Vision 2063 is to focus on what I call the organizing principle. Um, democracy beyond elections. We have seen in Africa that democracy became sort of the thing to do after the Cold War. But how far have we actually imbibed the culture of democracy? I think that's the challenge that faces many African countries, and that's part of what's being discussed today. So one of the highlights we should take away is that, is that democracy goes well beyond the process and the act of elections. Democracy is a mindset. Democracy is a path to progress. And that's one of the things I'm going to interrogate very quickly. How far have we made use of democracy as a path to progress? We can see clearly a huge yearning for democracy in many African countries. Like someone said, and I love that very much being an economist, uh, the demand for democracy exceeds supply. I love that. Um, and that's true. And that's very true. The role of elections, very important. If our, demo if our elections have no integrity, if we cannot cope with the logistics or the logistical demands of our elections, uh, are we really very serious uh, as, uh, as democratic practitioners? And we have these challenges in many African countries. I come from Nigeria. Uh, and we know the, the, the problems and challenges we've had with the logistics of elections. We've made progress. In 2015, they introduced what is called the permanent voter's card, and that helped to reduce rigging, because rigging is one of the biggest problems with elections. In some countries, actual rigging. In some countries, accusations of rigging, including this country, I might remind you, we had a candidate that always used to say, the whole thing has been rigged um, <laughs> in the United States. So I want to just mention very quickly the problem we have with democracy in Africa. So good, we send them into permanent retirement. 
That's very important. And that power rests with the citizens. And so that's, uh, these are some of the uh, few uh, remarks that I'd like to, to give and to uh, congratulate the panel uh, for a very uh, splendid uh, discussion and to thank the CFA uh, for convening this uh, excellent uh, roundtable this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, before we go, I understand that uh, Her Excellency Ambassador Chiambori may not be with us at the end of this, so I'd like to see if she'd like to have any comment before, before we break for... for um to the panelists, thank you, thank you, thank you for a wonderful, wonderful discussion and quite stimulating. Um, I'm just going to wrap up and echo a lot of what I've heard uh, from our panelists. But I thought that I should maybe just give you an insight of what's happening at the AU level pertaining to the diaspora. Going back to what I started with, OAU. The OAU was renamed AU in 2002, and since then our leaders, they meet twice a year to discuss issues pivotal to the development of the continent. You see the banner over there, Agenda 2063, that was formulated, it has seven aspirations of the African people. They came to those seven aspirations after consulting with all the African leaders as well as the African citizens. I was privy this year in January to sit uh, in what they are now calling the African Peer Review Mechanism. This is a mechanism that is elective. The heads of states uh, voluntarily participate in the process. And I listened to African leaders stand up one by one, give themselves a grade based on Agenda 2063 on how well they themselves are assessing their own progress within their countries. It was truly refreshing to listen to all of them one by one give themselves a failing grade. They realize that they are failing their people. Coming from the African leaders who we often hear people describe them as uh, a gang of dictators, for me it was refreshing. So I am sharing this with you to say there is hope for Africa, that we are moving in the right direction, the right conversations are taking place. Are we there yet? Absolutely not. Is everybody on the same page? Of course not. Africa is just like any other family. You got your drunken uncle, you got your schizophrenic aunt, And when we have our family reunion, we make sure that uncle is on vacation. <laughs> Why? I'm, because I'm often tackled with all oh, African leaders are corrupt. It goes back to that mentality again, that why are we constantly putting ourselves down? We have leaders in Africa who are doing very well. And then we have that menopausal land and the alcoholic uncle. We have some leaders who are not doing what they should be doing. But I can honestly tell you, collectively, as a group, as the AU, we are in the right direction. As you all know, President Kagame has been tasked with the responsibility of reforming the African Union. He does rule with an iron fist. Following each leader, giving themselves a failing grade, he chastised all of them and challenged them to do better. And this process goes on twice a year. But I can also tell you one thing that is central to every discussion held at the AU is the realization that for true sustainable change to come to Africa, it has to be brought by the African diaspora. Significant involvement by the African diaspora is a must, which is why, for me, listening to Professor uh, here talking about her research and, and her findings, and all the comments made by our panelists, realizing that we have friends of Africa who are working hard to bring us together as diaspora. But guess what? 
We as individual diaspora, we are fighting all those forces that are trying to help us come together so we can speak with one voice. From the African continent, we are now talking about not only regional integration, but continental integration. African Union is talking about melting those borders. But those borders are only going to melt to the extent that they melt in our heads. Until we as Africans, as diaspora, realize that our only sheer survival depends on our coming together. Why should anybody consider you relevant when you don't consider yourself relevant? You are insignificant because you choose to be insignificant. You walk into a bank as a poor man, do you think the banker is going to listen to you? No. That's just the way the world goes. But when our leaders hear that, guess what? The diaspora in America have $100 million, $500 million sitting in the bank. Guess what? They're going to start listening to us. The Indian diaspora, when they need anything, they go straight to the president. Because the president knows they matter. Nobody made them significant. They did. So until we come together as children of one mother Africa, until we truly have Africa born in us, the fault is ours and only ours. Our leaders are as good as the people around them. Professor, you made a very important comment there. Because if we, as the diaspora, don't take our position, make every effort to go home and bring that which we have learned. You see, those uh, leaders who are global-minded, they're not born. They're made. They're created. And guess what? We got lots of them, millions of them in the diaspora. We had uh, a group of lawyers go through, uh, what was that program, Mel? The ones that, it's a year program. It's not YALI, but it's, it's a group of lawyers that go through some program through Europe and the, your, through your, your Loyola University. I did an exercise asking each and every one of them, how do you feel today compared to a year ago at the beginning of the program. It was so refreshing to listen to all of them. These are young people who could easily be appointed by a president to be a minister, to be an advisor. And they all echoed the same sentiment. Oh my God. And here I was working for the African Union and I'm a lawyer and I thought I knew it all. They only applied because they wanted to leave Africa and go abroad. She said, I ne they said, we never thought we could really learn anything because we thought we knew it. They were absolutely blown away, amazed at what they learned. And so I did a video. And I've since sent the video to the AU. And I said, just, just let other employees just run these videos within the building. Let other employees realize how ignorant they are, and yet they think they know. I'm saying this sincerely to say that sometimes are the issues with our leadership. They truly do not know. So if you take somebody who just doesn't know, and you give them a task, they're going to deal with it the best way they know how. So it is really incumbent upon us as the African diaspora to organize so we can effectively begin to bring about the needed change in Africa. Scattered, that will never happen. And we've got to trust each other for a change. If my brother decides to go back to Nigeria and run for office, if he knows he has an army of diaspora behind him, he's going to behave. But when he goes on his own, he answers to nobody. We got so many able people within our diaspora that can go back home today and bring 
the change, the global mindedness that Africa and African leaders need. Here at the AU, we're starting a program where we're going to challenge and request that every able diaspora and friend of Africa contributes $10 a month. And we want you to register and be counted. So when we stand up as AU and want to speak on your behalf, we, are, we want to be able to say, why does Africa matter? Oh, Africa matters because, guess what? These are the many generals born in Africa who served in the US Army. These are the number of doctors who are taking care of Americans every day. The educators, the economists, you name it. But unless we are counted, we don't exist. I've often wanted to challenge companies that are doing business in Africa to say, hey, can you not find diaspora to occupy some of these top positions? Don't you realize returns on your investment are better if you were to hire an African? And the response almost un unanimously is, oh, sure, Ambassador, give us the names. And that's where it ends. Because I have no clue where you are. I don't know how to get in touch with you. Guess what? Ask Indian diaspora. They will break down their doctors, down to the urologist, to the orthopedic surgeon, to the pediatrician, at the click of a button. That's what people do who get it. People who have the colonial bug, the legacy of slavery, cleansed out of themselves. The question is, have you done that? Because until you do, when you donate that $10 a month, you're going to take your brother Mahal here to task and want him to give you explanations of what happened to my $10. But you will gladly give $1,000 to a non-African diaspora and not even think about it. So the issue is us. It starts with us. Who are we? Do we believe in ourselves? But I can honestly tell you one thing. Until we make a commitment to come together and organize as African diaspora, we are going to continue to sit back and watch our Africa looted. It's been going on. It will continue to go on while we, the intelligent, the beautiful, the sophisticated, the highly adaptable, and totally indestructible black people sit back from across the street and watch it all go down. Please help me out and give us some recommendations for what you think based on what, what you heard. Uh, don't leave me hanging at this uh, ceremony. I was at one last year, and I fortunately had some. So yes, Mel. And then I want to take the prerogative. One of my questions uh, has always been, I monitored many elections in Africa, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Gabon, and maybe a few others. But I've always been uh, disappointed with the lack of uh, African Americans and others in the diaspora as part of monitoring teams. Um, and I want to know what can be done to change that paradigm. You know, uh, you know it seemed to me that like half of the monitoring team should be black, 50% minimum. You know, uh, African immigrant, African American, African, you know, it should just be a part of this whole strategy. What can be done to increase the participation of our diaspora in monitoring teams uh, in Africa? Uh, panel? Let me, I, I'm, I'm, I will leave the sort of long-term expertise to Annette and Ifis to talk about that. But I do want to mention uh, that, to your point, uh, the, I was impressed with uh, NDI's election observation mission, which I would guarantee perhaps is atypical in terms of racial composition. Uh, Dr. Keith Jennings was sort of the principal on that mission. Half o or over half were women and over about half were women of color, if I'm yes. not 
mistaken, yes. And we had uh, Dr. Um, Amina Abdullahi with the, the uh, former PA uh, political affairs uh, contact for AU was part of the leadership team along with Congresswoman Karen Bass. Now, I, I can just say based on... Uh, and, and, and that's sort of the first election observation mission I've done. But in terms of the research that suggests that, you know, going back to my earlier point, it is important to sort of practice what we preach and ensure those voices are, are, um, are, are, are there and present. So I will say that I, I was pleasantly surprised and happy to be on a very racially diverse um, majority woman election observation mission with, with Dave Peterson as well. Thank you. To add to that, um, part of the challenge here is also kind of educating ourselves about what it, what it means to actually get onto observer missions and what you're kind of doing out into the field. Observer mission has professionalized uh, quite significantly over the last couple of years. I mean, the African Union itself has transformed its focus on short-term observer missions to uh, embrace a long-term uh, uh, framework and has set up a roster. Uh, and one of, I think, a key recommendation out of this to kind of kickstart this is, is to have the AU roster for observer missions also embrace the role of the diaspora in, in those kinds of missions. Because they bring a different perspective, they bring a different flavor, and a different insight. And besides the, the kind of groups like uh, NDI, there's also the Carter Center here in, uh, out in Atlanta that, that um, often takes groups out. Um, they were out in, in Kenya, they are currently out in uh, uh, Liberia for the upcoming 10th of October elections, um, along with NDI. So there are groups that are there and you need to kind of get onto their programs um, and let them know that you are interested. But then at this, by the same token, kind of also educate yourself about what it actually means to be an election observer. Because the days of just doing anecdotal observation is long gone. Oh, you go first. Uh, I'll just uh, reemphasize that point. I think uh, the recommendation would be simply to uh, talk to NDI and IRI and the Carter Center that, uh, you know, organized most of the observation missions. I think, I, I know that uh, for NDI especially, uh, that uh, they look at the uh, missions as being international. So it's not just an American observation mission. Uh, it's composed, you know, in the case of Africa, uh, there are many Africans that are actually on uh, the observer mission. But, uh, you know, I think uh, to, uh, as the uh, ambassador was saying, you know, uh, if there was a uh, actual database of, uh, you know, qualified uh, election observers, diaspora or uh, what have you, you know, I think that's something that uh, they take seriously. Okay, and I'll just, uh, I can't add anything to what's already been said, but I'd just like to make, um, re-echo the point that um, Diaspora engagement on governance and democracy in Africa is a lot more than just the elections. And we have congressional delegations. We have trade groups going out there. We have social engagement and community engagement groups going out from here to the African continent to expand Mill's question. How do we ensure that there's a lot more engagement? Definitely one would be to subscribe to the ambassador's um, um, database of who has expertise in what. But second is for us to get more actively involved and not wait to be called. Uh, because um, you could have the, um, um, on a national basis, on a regional basis, on a functional basis, we can come together and um, if we know that country X has a need. Um, there's no reason why a banker from Zimbabwe can't team up with an investment advisor from Nigeria and form a team that could go out and be a lot more impactful than someone <coughs> just parachuting into the um, equation. And so I think we could think a little, broad, a little more broadly, and not just about how we monitor elections, but how we participate in establishing strong pillars for democracy across the continent. This gentleman had a question. Yes, sir. My name is uh, Arnold King, and I'm a business consultant owner. And my, I got a question in the recommendation. But first, my question is, uh, what are the percentage of African countries that have corruption in the lesson? In other words, what it done to solve corruption in the lesson? 
And now my recommendation for our manor is that uh, the CBC should consider its main institute program on Africa and that would have input internship about how learning how work is done in government, agriculture, healthcare, and other just like they had you all had internship Japan and China should still have internship in our Africa as well. Well, um, just if I could just start answering that, you know, we have done a lot of technical assistance in Africa. And we've trained a lot of people in Africa, many of whom get frustrated at home yeah. and leave, which is why the diaspora is so big. So there are a lot of trained people in the diaspora. They just happen not all to be in Africa. There was, um, I, I know we had um, someone report that there are more doctors from Benin in Paris than in all of Benin. And there's something wrong with that. Um, certainly, we appreciate the African professionals who are here, who who do everything from you know nursing to to uh, uh, physical therapy to accounting to being a lawyer. But it would be useful if they could be at home doing that. But the the conditions have to be right. If you can earn two hundred thousand dollars a year as a as a as a doctor here. And you go back home and you can only get a tenth of that. You know, you have medical uh, schooling to pay. And, and there's a push-pull. You know, you're a doctor and you're doing an operation in Kinshasa and the lights go out and they stay out. You're looking for medical equipment and you don't have it. In, in uh, Angola for a while, there the only way the, the, their hospitals could get medicine was to go buy it on the, on the parallel market. I try not to call it the black market. And the thing is, that's wrong. I mean, you, you, it's, it's pushing out really good people. And so we can continue to do um, programs where we do technical assistance, but we need to work with the International Organization on Migration, for example, which has return policies. Some people come back for three months, six months, a year, two years. Some go back permanently. But we have to look toward how do we replace the expertise that's left Africa? So let me uh, let my, my colleagues have their comments. Okay, um, just um, a quick da data point on um, the diaspora and um, migration issues. Um, a lot of um, recent studies are showing that you have a lot more um, diaspora, Africa diaspora within the African continent. Um, you have um, not just um, leaving the continent, but you have them within the continent as well. So as we think about creative ways to get people to um, repatriate, we also have to um, appreciate that there is a fair amount that is still on the continent and how we engage them and how we get them to also have a voice. Because it seems to me that a lot of the thinking is how do we get to reach those who are in Europe, in, in um, the United States, or in, in all North America, but there's a lot of um, qualified Africans within the continent as well. And just briefly to your point, I, I completely agree. Uh, we, we do have the Donald Payne uh, Senior Foreign Fo Policy Fellowship, uh, which is a two-year uh, paid fellowship. However, to your point, there was a time under a former uh, leadership at the foundation where we were able to take our fellows to South Africa. Mm -hmm. um, we did have a China and Japan program for the past few years, and we are looking to partner with institutions and organizations that would like to look for funding with us so that we could indeed uh, take our students uh, to the continent. So. Mm -hmm. To kind of link in the question of corruption in elections, I think one of the biggest challenges that we have on the continent is the role that money plays in politics. Um, uh, campaign finances, many countries shy away from being more transparent around their campaign financing. And this is an area that does require much more scrutiny. Um, it requires much more local legislation. Um, and a higher standard of transparency. I mean, you have one of the most progressive democracy and governance instruments in international public law through the African Charter um, on democracy, governance, and elections. And then more needs to be done in this particular area around uh, campaign finances 
to, to bring some of the, that information out into the public eye. We're seeing election campaigns, it's been mentioned, uh, uh, more money is available for election campaigns than sometimes for certain developmental uh, priorities. And it's a winner-take-all, high-stakes game, um, and yet we don't often have insights into what role the private or private individuals uh, and private sector has in um, uh, campaigning, and we need to have much more um, transparency in that area. We have recommended on the Hill that the administration, this one and the previous one, use the full powers of our uh, sanctions on individuals because usually we have, you know, base surface sanctions. In other words, you can't come to the United States, you can't get a visa, and if you have money in American banks, we'll seize that money and freeze it, which we did with the Abacha funds, which are about a half a billion dollars. However, what person who's stealing that kind of money is actually going to put it in the United States knowing that we're going to seize it? The thing is, it's around the world, and the United States Treasury Department and um, agencies from around the world have worked together to create a network whereby when the money is moved, usually it's changed into dollars or some other convertible currency, and it's like a red flag pops up, and then you can seize it then. You might not know where it is now because it's dormant, but once it's active, when you take a million dollars out, now red flag goes up because past a certain amount of money, all banks have to report these kind of transactions. So this is in the works, but we have to get our government and other governments to actually use the authority we already have in order to find and, and to seize money. I know the Nigerian government right now is uh, working on a, um, a process to recover stolen funds, like that half a billion uh, that we froze from, from Abacha. That's really not all of the money. There's a lot more money. Uh, Mrs. Abacha was caught uh, with, I think, $750 million trying to leave Nigeria years ago. They found the son in his home with a lot of money. Now, I ask anybody in here, what happened to that money when it was seized? This is why people feel reluctant to help governments go after money, because when it's, when it's finally found, what are you going to do with it? The Nigerians have asked us, um, they've come to Congress and they've asked us to, to press for the money to be returned. But we have to have some kind of assurances that this money is going to be used um, appropriately for, for the people and not just stolen again. Otherwise, now we are accomplices in the second theft of the same money. So we're working on that right now. And uh, to its credit, the government of Nigeria has, um, is about to engage some people from here who've worked on these issues for a long time and who are, are um, looking to, to try and locate the money, but also create a process for which it won't be restolen. So I don't know if anybody else has any comment. Don't, OK. All right. um, not on that, too. Just to add to the, um, you know, there, a lot of points have been made about getting um, professionals from the diaspora to return to the countries to contribute. Uh, in 1977, UNDP introduced something called TOCTEN, and the acronym stands for Transfer of Knowledge Through Expatriate Nationals, which was basically a UNDP fund that paid um, professionals from outside their countries to repatriate and serve for a period. I think a lot of lessons could be learned from that experience. Some things that happened that um, didn't go so well, others went pretty well. But I think that it does provide at least a basis for our understanding of what lies within the realm of the possible. Yes, Ambassador. Um, just wanted to bring to everybody's awareness that the African billionaires have approached President Kagame and they are ready, willing, and able to step up. If we, the African diaspora, could come together and mobilize X amounts of funds, for example, this is my challenge to them. If we mobilize $100 million as the African diaspora, 
would they help us leverage it over to a billion dollars? The answer to that has been yes. So we have something to look forward to. Secondly, the African leaders are stepping up to the plate. We have 132 acres of land given to us by the president of Zambia. It's on the uh, Zambian side of Victoria Falls. So now we have 132 acres to put up a diaspora village. Here at the African Union, our plan is to build five regional centers of excellence in healthcare. There will be a thousand bed hospital out of that one billion, a thousand bed hospital, two five star hotels, a um, pharmaceutical manufacturing plant, plus of course the housing and everything else that goes with it. I'm saying this to say, we as the diaspora, we don't have to wait for somebody to hire us when we go back home, we are going to be employers and self-employers. So we have got to create situations and environments that we move our own agenda forward, rather than depending on others to get us where we want to be. We are the diaspora who bring in $60 billion into Africa every year. Yes, we can do this. We just have to come together. And I'm so glad to say the African billionaires are stepping up to the plate and through President Kagame and what we can do as diaspora through our uh, uh, organizing, we can move Africa forward independently without having to depend on anyone. Okay. What I'd like to hear here was about education of the masses because you cannot have proper edu Democracy, if um, uh, without the mass be having the proper choice, and you cannot have proper choice without truly being educated. The other one is also information. I mean, information is lacking even within our diaspora here. We don't have the proper information at the right time. Uh, I think these are two issues also we need to tackle as a diaspora and engaging our diaspora together. From our perspective, we created a social network platform where the Africans will be able to kind of bring their skills and network each other. But I think it should have been maybe coming from the African Union. Um, the other thing also is a question for you all. Uh, are we going to promote democracy as the rest of the world sees it, or democracy as, as Africans? You know, because we, we, have, we, we should be having our own models of democracy, and we have to own it, too. I mean, receiving funds is okay, but me as a diaspora member, I have a problem when the African Union or some other groups like ECOWAS or something are receiving funds from Europeans or America, because then they will be defending their views. And when we're discussing about, uh, for example, platform, uh, let's say, for example, in the ECOWAS platform, where they'll be discussing about how to deal with um, uh, Europe, uh, their market and stuff like that. Already they have the European Union members sitting at the table of discussion where we're discussing about private matters to how to deal with them because they're funding uh, most, of the, most of the meetings and discussion we have. So th the question is uh, how do you want to promote African democracy in the African perspective, and how we, you, you believe that we should uh, work to own our own democracy and uh, our own ways of doing things. Well, I'd like to ask uh, uh, Rusty and, um, and Dave you. to talk about these, because both of their organizations have done education around civic education and voter education. Thank you. Um, there's maybe some mythologies that we also need to kind of move from. Um, the notion that uh, Western democracies are the primary model um, is something which we do need to look at. Uh, we have seen over the recent years, um, especially under the, 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 the African Charter, a big shift and a focus on shared values amongst African nations about what it is that it, that um, democracy actually means for different African countries. And we see with the Agenda 2063 a much clearer effort to define that. 
And within that, I think international organizations and donors are obliged to look at what, what those requirements are. It's not a case of importing something from outside, but rather looking at what is on the ground and what is it that needs to be amplified and scaled. Um, so the work that organizations like IFAS and other international organizations have been able to do has been to, yes, look comparatively at what is happening around the world, but also acknowledge very clearly that there are domestic contexts um, and understandings, which means that you've got to tap into what people know and move from where they are, as opposed to thinking that you can parachute um, uh, something, a concept in from outside. So what we, one of the, the, the big things that we sometimes lack in doing is look at what genuine innovations have come out of the African content, continent with regards to democracy of, and governance. Um, some of the figures that I've cited uh, um, in my presentation earlier speaks to that, that there's a lot that can be learned from African democracies around, for example, the issues of independence of election management bodies. That's a foreign concept on this continent um, uh, where you're looking at what is it that defines an independent election management body? And Africa is an example where that is used to, uh, and is commonplace. Um, uh, another area, for example, is the use of technology. Um, yes, it has proven problematic in some countries, but by the same token, African countries have shown how the use of technology in elections can be done effectively. Um, so there, there are a number of different examples like this. But more and more we're starting to see that issues of civic education are imperative to be exploring much more. Um, we, we see examples in places like uh, Zambia um, and in Kenya as well, where civic education has been fused into the, the local curriculum, uh, schools curriculum, which helps amplify and invest much more in the education system. But much more needs to be done. And for one, we need to recognize what is being done, celebrate that, and then work to actually do a lot more. Um, yeah, I think uh, to your point about um, education, uh, uh, it is something that I think a lot more attention needs to be paid to. Of course, uh, I know uh, with your organization uh, working on social media, uh, that's become a huge phenomenon uh, in Africa, and uh, we're uh, seeing a big impact that social media is having on uh, political participation and uh, information about uh, uh, politics. I think, uh, you know, the concern that uh, uh, we're having, though, is that uh, despite all this information that is getting out there, uh, you know, civic education, or uh, particularly in the case of social media, uh, radio, what have you, but uh, still, uh, especially among youth, uh, the uh, political participation rates are uh, quite low. Uh, I was in Zimbabwe a, a while back, and I was told that uh, in the uh, elections they just had there, uh, less than 10% of young people actually uh, voted. Uh, and uh, I think this is a problem uh, uh, around the continent. And so it's not just a matter of education. I think it's a, a matter of um, incentivization. I mean, you know, young people in particular have to feel like uh, their participation is going to make a difference, that it's meaningful. Uh, there's a lot of apathy out there, and I think uh, you know, that's something that really needs to be overcome. Uh, a couple of, uh, I, I'm going to get to you folks in just a second, I promise you. Um, on the style of democracy, uh, back in 1994, I, I, yeah, 1994 I created this organization called the African Democracy Network, thanks to USAID. Um, and we looked at what democracy means to Africa. And uh, an African colleague and myself wrote a paper for that conference, which looked at varied ways, varied means of holding elections and, and structuring a democracy based on the history of your country, uh, the number of ethnic groups, the history of conflict. Everybody's different. When I used to do training, on the continent, I would never train people to do things the way we do things here, because the way we do things here is unique. Canada doesn't do things the way we do. Mexico doesn't. The United Kingdom, from which we came, doesn't. Nobody else does it like we do. Everybody does it to suit their situation. 
there was a woman, Lanny Guineer, I don't know how many of you remember her, some of you old timers do. She was an attorney and a friend of um, Bill Clinton when he was in college. She came out with this paper once about different ways of having elections, but she was talking about the United States. That was a non-starter in the States. We have a way of doing things. Some of the things she suggested were exotic for us, but they certainly fit some African situations. So my colleague and I took into account some of the things she had said, and I'm, I'm trying to resurrect that, that paper because it was a long time ago, and see if we can put that out again, because I think that you have to have, democracy has to fit your situation, not a, a cookie cutter thing. Uh, now, I think this gentleman and um, these two ladies, but please uh, keep it, so we're, sure. we're running out of time and I want to make sure you get your point across. Sure. Go ahead. Uh, so, no, I this guy. Yes. I noticed uh, that we talk about education a lot and human resources. One, one, of the things, one of the things that we have not mentioned is to have the tools that are necessary when you educate people. And that's, that's specifically, uh, I'm, I'm talking about medical uh, education. Uh, in 2011, Walter Reed closed, and we walked from Walter Reed, D.C. to Walter Reed, Bethesda, and left all that equipment there. That equipment was state-of-the-art equipment, which we tried to get transferred from um, the United States to Africa. And it was, it was not successful. However, we have a lot of places like that in the United States, especially uh, uh, a defense uh, uh, department uh, equipment that is transferred from e either um, the defense department to our local communities and or could be transferred to another country so that, that, so that when you educate in certain disciplines that you have the tools to work with. And, and I think if we could get a, t a think tank to work with or a, a collaborative group to work with uh, uh, accessing that e medical equipment, which is housed in, in Atlanta, Georgia, and Italy, so that it can be used for training purposes in uh, the, the countries that requ requ request them and have the uh, infrastructure to use them. So um, that is one thing I've been trying to have happen since 1983, and it still has not happened. One of the issues is um, transporting the equipment, the cost of transporting the equipment. Once, once someone can work on that issue, you can get all types of medical equipment donated, not only from the Defense Department, but from some other hospitals as well, to be used in training uh, in, in uh, the countries that ask for them. And that is absolutely necessary, medical equipment. Yeah. There is um, um, a program that USAID has called the Ocean Freight program where they move it on military ships that are already going toward Africa. But it takes, it takes an NGO with a private voluntary organization status to be able to do it. But I would suggest that it probably would make sense for that organization to work with the African Union so that when it gets to Africa, there is a repository, and then then it can be distributed. Absolutely, so, that is one. That was yes. one of the criteria that we asked for. Not only the repository, but tracking it, right. and also having biomedical technicians to validate the equipment once it gets there. Because you you cannot have equipment transported from one place to another place without validation of the efficacy of that equipment. Sure. So that is part of the training program as well. Okay. This gentleman in the suit, light suit. Uh, my name is Gustavo Nvela. I'm with the Committee for Free and Democratic Equatorial Guinea. So uh, as a son of a diplomat, I'm going to suspend uh, diplomacy and speak frankly. You know, since 1991, I've been coming to a lot of these functions, and I've realized that the inertia that those of us committed to the rule of law, good governance, democracy, civil society, that we run up against lobbying firms, multinational companies, the U.S. government, for those of us, and I go back to the days of Hans Hogreff, who was with Congressman Tom Lantos in 1991, and I promise you, this is almost like deja vu, same, same dis issues discussed, different faces, but the same issues. So as someone who is a member of the diaspora, who is committed to the rule of law, getting rid of dictators like Tito Obiang, Paul Bia, Mr. Bongo, who in many ways are 
in power because they have hidden hands behind them keeping them in power? Yes. What's the shell game? Yes. What's the game? Because we all know that sometimes it's easier to keep an ignorant person in power because they can be manipulated. But the last time I, 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 I heard, you only need one house, you only need one car, some of these folks need multiple wives. But the reality is that when it comes to the African diaspora, many of us aren't taken seriously. We're met at the front door, but mocked in the back door. So this is a shell game. After 26 years of this, this has become a shell game. Okay, does anyone want to comment on that? Yes, Ambassador. My dear brother, your point is very well taken. What I often say to the African leaders is that diaspora are not just remittances. There is more to the diaspora than just the monies that we send home uh, to the tune of some, I think the highest recorded was $65 billion in one year. Uh, the smallest amount was uh, 2015, I believe, we were like $35 billion. So your point is very well taken in terms of how the diaspora are not being taken seriously. The reason we're not being taken seriously is because we have not behaved in a manner that we need to be taken seriously. I go back again to what I said about the Indian diaspora. They go straight to the president. They have made themselves relevant. So we need to take it to the next level. Your sentiments are well taken. Your, um, your frustrations are well taken. But I think we now need to move away from the complaining phase to doing something about it. We have identified a problem. We know we are moving African economies. Some countries cannot survive without the remittances from the diaspora. Uh, so we got to move away from that and say, how then do we begin to make ourselves relevant? And I don't mean to sound like a broken record, but we have got to unite and speak with one voice uh, as, uh, as, as, as people of African descent. And let me also please reiterate something I forgot to uh, state, which I always say in my speeches, is the definition of who is the African diaspora. The African diaspora are all people of African descent living outside Africa. All people of African descent. My territory in this position is not only the Americas. My territory covers Canada, South America, Central America, and the Caribbean. We are all in this together. So it's absolutely imperative that we unite and uh, let the world know our relevance. Okay. Uh, this gentleman here in front, and then we're going to go into the back. I was going to say uh, the, the ambassador, when she was talking about uh, the, the definition of the diaspora, this is really where it's at in terms of how effective uh, people uh, can be. There is a, a coalition in this country that involves not only um, people of African origin, um, um, African Americans as such, but uh, other individuals with um, and groups and institutions with uh, backgrounds and uh, and so on that speak to uh, what is actually what actually needs to be uh, done um, uh, in, in in the African context. One of the most effective coalitions that ever took place for change happened in the late 1980s and, uh, and early 90s when uh, the. African American community organized with a variety of other groups and managed to topple apartheid. Okay. That happened. Um, the, the same groups can be utilized to avoid shell games and everything that is going on to make African issues relevant here so that they can become newsworthy, as Dr. Demesis was saying. When those issues become relevant, here, the effect is not felt here, it is felt in Africa, because it is where these things uh, uh, begin, uh, where people begin to see that, uh, you know, at, over there, whether it's a superpower or whatever, people are being, are being serious in something and, ch and change and begins to happen. I am saying that if we're really talking about getting organized, then let us organize a bigger coalition, a bigger diaspora, and we have the means and uh, the possibility in which to do it. Uh, 
My name is uh, Okwa, Chivon Okwa. I'm visiting from Nigeria. And uh, I'm also involved in politics. I've been involved in the organization of the structure that uh, prepares politics. So it's quite refreshing for me to be here to uh, listen to various speakers. And uh, uh, since I'm familiar with what the problems are, I think this is really very refreshing. Let me identify what the problem is. The problem we have is that of leadership. Leadership. And you have a role, this, the diaspora, you have a role to play in that particular area. The role you have to play is to make sure that various institutions that governs the government. Let's say I'm talking about Africa, that they are strengthened through NGOs. In other words, make sure that the NGOs, whatever role they are playing, whatever role you have to play to uh, make sure that they become strong uh, and very effective in their role in making sure that the government does what they are supposed to do, it's very important for you to continue to strengthen their hand. Then, there are also other organizations or agencies that do exist that interact with our governments back there. Also, make sure that, please, you strengthen uh, whatever, use whatever various methods you have to use to make sure that you put them in line to make sure that they do not violate the rights of people, they do not trample upon the rights of individuals, that there's freedom of the press, uh, they obey rule of law, they are not law to themselves. And there was something else that the ambassador mentioned uh, I only have one disagreement with that. I like Kigami, I think that's his name. But this idea of a leader that he's so good, if his tenure is only two years, that he must extend it, it's not acceptable. No matter how good you are, there is also another person that is very good. All you need to do is train leaders. Professor Moalu, the Kingsley Moalu, mentioned that, something in that area. We need to work on that, that no matter how strong, you cannot sit back and begin to extend your tenure. It's very important. And all of you here, please continue to work and make sure that you bring back Leaders, leader, what we need, identify leaders. Mo'alu, when Mo'alu was speaking there, he articulated to me what I know are the virtues of a, a good leader. You must have clear vision. You must come to render service, not to line up your pockets. And you have, must have an agenda. These are the areas that you people will have to work on and produce a leader that you bring to us back there, and then we'll have a good continent. Uh, this young lady here. Thank you. My name is Elodie Shami, and I work at the Embassy of Rwanda. And I'm glad that I'm speaking following the, uh, the gentleman in the back. Sir, thank you for your comments. And I hope that um, if you look at what you just detailed as the qualities of a leader, or an effective leader for Africa, you will see that that's the profile of President Kagame currently. Um, the problem I feel for a long time has been that even subconsciously we keep thinking about leadership or leadership style or democracy style um, of the West as what befits the, 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 the continent of Africa or different um, countries in Africa. And I think that it is time that us as Africans, we start to think of um, Africa-specific solutions for Africa-specific problems. And I think that that's what President Kagame has done so good. He has found homegrown solutions that have benefited the country. Although Rwanda, and especially President Kagame, keeps, keeps getting attacked that he has extended his uh, tenure, which if you do your research, you will find that he didn't do it. The people of Rwanda requested it, went through the parliament, 
followed the referendum and voting, where he was elected by 98%. And everybody who was an observer at those elections can repeat this. So I think that it is time that as Africans, we start to think of ways um, that benefit us, things that, or look at leaders that do have the competence that are putting in their um, governments technocrats who are working towards um, advancing the Africa agenda or their country's agendas, people who are working for their people. If you look at Rwanda statistics from 1994, you will see that it keeps rising and we will not let our democracy be de defined by the number of uh, tenure or the number of uh, times that a president can be elected. We will measure our democracy by how the people of Rwanda are served. And if that means that we want President Kagame to run for a third term, then that will be it. Um, but um, in general, I think that it is, it is an African issue to start really looking at Africa-specific solutions. I like that you said, um, Mr. Simpkins, that you can't do the same thing in Canada as you're doing in Britain. But unfortunately for Africa, we have a, pr a, pl a problem of dependency. We depend on these funds. And most of the time, it comes with expectations that we will abide by certain things that don't necessarily um, benefit Africans. So in the reform of the AU chaired by President Kagame, I hope that this will bring some sort of a change that will see a lot of African countries move in the direction that Rwanda is moving in. Thank you. Uh, this lady here. Yes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, so mine is a very quick question. Um, Two points. I uh, just want to uh, reiterate what I just heard the ambassador say, that it's all people of African descent, including those who've been here for several generations by virtue, not by virtue, but by virtue of the past and also the horror of the past of the slave trade um, here in the U.S. And there's an important role to play that was just uh, pointed out around the anti-apartheid struggle uh, in which there was uh, coalition building amongst the various groupings of African descent in the United States, in particular, I cite. So just to underscore the importance of us coming together, and there's much work to be done to bridge these various waves of people of African descent in the US, never mind, uh, as well as the global community. So I want to give real emphasis to the importance of that. So that's one point. Uh, but the second point is I didn't think I heard anything relative to the sustainable development goal. And I'm very interested to know how you see the various perspectives lifted, which were just wonderful, by the way, of how the SDGs align with some of the thoughts that have been shared this morning that were really wonderful. Thank you. Uh, there were several questions I'd like to speak to. Uh, uh, the first one is this um, uh, matter of the, the shell game, I guess uh, as it's been called. You know, I think uh, it's important to recognize the progress really that has been made uh, in Africa politically, uh, you know, since the years that uh, Greg and um, Mel and I uh, first started, uh, you know, working on this. Uh, I mean, I consider West Africa these days to really be a, a bastion of democracy in the world. Uh, we've seen, you know, significant uh, progress just in the last few years, free elections, uh, you know, changes of government, uh, you know, there's only one country, I think, uh, in the region now that um, uh, is not, you know, fully democratic. And that's not to deny that there are a lot of uh, problems that still exist, uh, even in these democratic countries. Uh, you know, problems of governance, uh, corruption, uh, insecurity. Uh, but I think that there has been uh, progress uh, throughout the uh, continent. I mean, there are, are certainly countries uh, Equatorial Guinea or, uh, you know, a number of others where, uh, mm -hmm. you know, there has not been progress uh, uh, or uh, where there's not been enough progress. Uh, but, uh, you know, and obviously there are uh, Americans, Europeans, other uh, interests around the world that are inhibiting uh, progress in Africa and, and those people need to be called out and uh, stop from uh, continuing those negative policies. But, you know, uh, on the whole, I would say there has been progress in Africa, and, and uh, that needs to be acknowledged. Uh, you know, uh, another uh, problem that we're often uh, dealing with in Africa, I think, is a uh, kind of distinction between uh, democracy and governance. So that um, you can have countries that are you know, perhaps very well governed, uh, that have uh, great economic growth, uh, 
uh, you know, that uh, seem fairly stable, and yet um, there's no freedom, or there's, re you know, relatively little freedom. There's uh, relatively little respect for human rights. And, of course, you know, these things can be defined in many ways, um, uh, but with all due respect to uh, President Kagame, and, you know, maybe there are some others, you know, I think that um, uh, he's doing some great things in Rwanda, uh, but, uh, you know, I think leaders such as him and these other leaders who, you know, are trying to extend uh, their term limits, uh, I think they need to have uh, more respect, as somebody was mentioning here, you know, for uh, their citizens that there are other people, there are uh, other leaders that are capable of uh, doing just as well, uh, you know, that there are institutions that need to be established that are going to uh, preserve the democracy, and that's not all just dependent on one person. Uh, it's the institutions. That's why, you know, the, the United States is surviving as a democracy. It's not because of the guy that we elect president uh, that's, you know, uh, making us a democracy. It's the institutions uh, that uh, are really uh, what it's all about. Uh, and so um, I think I'll leave it at that. Uh, just a brief point on the um, sustainable development goals. That's an excellent point. I think one of the things I've been trying to hammer um, throughout this panel is that we focus not just on a democratic event, the elections, but we focus on a process that builds the sort of um, institutions that my colleague just mentioned. Um, the Sustainable Development Goals, unlike the Millennium Development Goals, included a lot of consultation across the African continent. Um, but I still don't think that we have the um, specific goals and objectives that are as Africa-centric as they should be. This is one area in which um, the brain trust in the diaspora could be useful. Um, what's an Africa-focused goal 16, which is on security and peace and security? What does that really mean on the continent? And how do we have resources that we could throw at not just the problem, but the solution long term. Um, we really need a lot more um, diaspora involvement in this because of the um, one, the diaspora are removed from the day-to-day -day um, the day-to-day -day issues in the respective countries, but also they have usually a more broader globalized perspective. So absolutely, the SDGs should be part of the equation. We think of them as, you know, democracy beyond the elections. And I'll just briefly say, too, on the education piece, because I think your comments brought it home. At the end of the day, uh, there's a huge learning curve that has to, to take place. And to the extent that the, the, the discourse and rhetoric sort of stays in this sort of top level, how do we educate, uh, we need to really deconstruct what that means, right? I mean, I, I was in Nigeria with the House Democracy Partnership last October, and I was floored. I mean, almost all the MPs either had a PhD. If they didn't have a PhD, it didn't matter because they knew <laughs> the statutes of the Constitution like the back of their hand. So if you talk about education in its most general sense, they're highly educated. In fact, I mean, they can recite uh, I, I, you know, verses to you, and I think they would give our members of Congress here a run for their money. I mean, they, they literally are the book of the Constitution in their head. So when you talk about it to that extent, you know, they, they, they are uh, highly educated. On the other hand, when it comes to things like trust and faith in government, um, you know, the overemphasis of educating oneself, for instance, the hackneyed term of getting training has, you know, I, I hear it all the time. And yes, it's, it's important and needed. Um, but a lot of it is also common sense, human relations, getting out there. What does representation mean, right? In political science, we always look at roll call data. A lot of the discourse has said that's not enough. Just how someone votes doesn't necessarily tell you why they did vote that way. Go out there to the community, talk to the people. Don't be fearful of the citizenry. That's the first thing in terms of building trust. If no one's talking to each other and it's just about getting training to make sure that you execute a bill on the floor in the appropriate manner before it, you know, 
that's that's about the process. You know, I, I think to a certain extent, perhaps uh, some of the sort of state actors are overly educated to the point where they need to actually invest more in social human communication with uh, civil societies, right? And we need to hold everybody accountable <coughs> in that regard. We cannot sort of isolate certain responsibilities to those who proclaim, I'll be in this space helping the community while these folks represent over here. They, they are all part of the same spectrum of education. The other piece is equity as opposed to equality of education. Education, right. So, if you look at some of the goals, it's about you know electing. I mean, Rwanda again stands out in terms of its representation of women MPs, right? And you've got the gender rule in the case of Kenya, and and and, and the list goes on and on. Good targets, but at the same time, are we are we only trying to increase the number, or are we trying to also think about the uh, sort of equity of opportunity and what that, that means? And so it's not just about hitting a target number, uh, but making sure that the education piece is one that uh, provides equity, the quality of education when we say, you know, millions of, of, uh, of kids remain uneducated. What is the quality? It's not just about getting them to school. The last piece I'll say, which is, uh, has been on my mind lately just because of friends who have uh, been born and raised here and gone back and started businesses, uh, friends that I grew up with here, um, and they are doing very well. We know that Africa sustained the um, sort of negative repercussions of the recession primarily because they are um, uh, robustly secured by informal markets. And um, it, you, you have seen success stories of, of, of young folks and other entrepreneurs who, are, who have moved back home, right? Uh, they get this story uh, at the same time um, I often wonder how does this help expand sort of, for instance, the social safety net, right? I just went to Addis recently after five years of being there. I mean, you can't even cross the street. There's so many buildings everywhere. They're not really filled or occupied. You go to the cafe, it's full. It, you know, life looks great. But it looks great for a very small number of very uh, sort of uh, uh, well-resourced people. And I wonder, you know, if this cafe would ask, would, would start to say something like, hey, you know, when you come to get your macchiato, do you mind fundraising maybe five ten percent we're trying to help the local kids around the neighborhood could you drop you know just um you, to think in practical terms helps be and i think also not just the collective but the individual you know economic power is driving um africa and the young when we talk about the africa the sort of power of leveraging africa youth a lot of these a lot of my sisters and brothers are there right now doing very well and i am also holding them accountable how is what you're doing here not just filling your own pockets but how is it helping change the narrative of what social reformation looks like beyond just you know um, making money right and, and and building wealth and capital how is how is when we talk about economic growth is it just about GDP growing or is it about it closing the income and poverty gap right these are things that you can think about when we talk about how to educate the population and ensure that economic power is actually spread to to the masses incrementally I will have to go soon. <laughs> um, so maybe my, my kind of closing contribution would be to, in relation to the Millennium Development Goals, um, the SDGs as well, is to, to encourage people to think through what does leadership transformation look like on the African continent. On the 10th of October, you've got the first black woman head of state stepping down. Does that now mean you count on less than one hand the African heads of states that are women? Um, more needs to be done and more positions not just created in terms of elected positions but as as with Kenya which faces its own challenges with trying to implement the equity uh, principle there needs to be a political will to actually um, invest in this level of transformation and not just in the level of education um, the participation of women as voters but participation of women as leaders and I think that's where an amazing amount of transformation needs to happen an investment um, that could be done by the diaspora in terms of encouraging voters because as we saw uh, Alan Sirleaf, uh, Johnson Sirleaf was able to because of her role in the international community come back after being elected and actually um, ensure that there were was some significant changes which happened and she got voted in by market women um, in Liberia as the story kind of goes we need to see much more of that kind of level of transformation across the whole of African politics mm -hmm. And by the way, she will be, the President Sirleaf Johnson will be at the Washington Convention Center at our annual legislative conference this Friday, um, September 22nd, for Congresswoman Karen Bass's Brain Trust. That's 9 to 5.
Um, so we encourage you to come. It's free and open to the public. Yes, my name is Ewell Anderson, and I work with I the African American Future Society, and I um, conduct a lot of research on future scenario development. Um, one of the things that I'd like to get back to as far as the dias diaspora and outreach is that I do not see any welcome mat coming from any African countries right now welcoming any African Americans to basically come home, like a come back to Jamaica commercial that we used to see back in the early 80s. So I'd like to see uh, international the Mic's off. There you go. Yeah, so I'd just like to see an international campaign um, welcoming um, African Americans back to Africa in order to um, groundswell and scale the types of development and activities that the ambassador and some of the uh, panelists um, asked for. Um, one of the other things I wanted to talk about was global governance. And I wanted to uh, talk about the role of the African Union in basically trying to establish a national uh, parliamentary government uh, for the continent trying to establish a national educational standard, for example. Um, I see that we're trying to establish a national um, health care standard. But as long as the African um, governments and, um, are independently established and they're in their present weakened state, they're liable for um, to be taken advantage of by other outside influences, um, like China, for example and other types of countries that are basically robbing Africa of its natural resources and basically starving the continent. Uh, the last part is, how do you create 400 million jobs for those uh, youth uh, to reach the 2063 uh, campaign goals? In the question about economic opportunity, there have been many African countries that have done well, particularly those that have a natural resource, such as oil. How um, can the proceeds from the oil be distributed better to increase uh, and get people out of poverty? And there is enough money to go around. It's just that the few want to take it and live well, while there are many living in abject poverty. And so we have to get out of this idea that uh, one person takes all the money and it becomes greed. Uh, one country who had oil made sure that all of their citizens were, high, were housed properly, had health care, et cetera, et cetera. I feel in Africa, coming from a continent starting out in history, which always shared. That has, has you know, not happened recently with the discovery of the oil, the diamonds, the whatever that they've always had. So how can we develop that mentality in Africa? Uh, professor, and then. Yeah. There you go. Okay. As a citizen of Nigeria, which is an oil producing country, um, as a former senior economic policy maker on the continent, I can't let the last question and comment pass on oil without making a comment. Um, I'd like to know this African country that has housed all its citizens and given them all health care because it had oil. Uh, that's number one. I'd love to know that country, and I would love to duff my heart for it. One of the, I didn't have a lot of time on the podium, but one of the challenges that leadership and democracy faces in Africa is the question of how or whether democracy can translate into economic development for Africa. Because as uh, uh, David said, you, there are many countries that have developed without following the de democratic model of governance. So, so there's a difference between democracy and governance. Now, one of the leadership problems we have in Africa, which, I, which goes to the issue of understanding, is understanding what creates the wealth of nations. 
many of our leaders or many of our political leaders don't have this. What creates the wealth of nations is economic complexity. And that is the manufacture of complex products with value and insight added to them and the export of same. If you look at most of the world, the wealthy countries of the world, they have no minerals. So one of the fundamental leadership failures in the continent is the belief, the mistaken notion that our mineral wealth will help us grow economically. But what happens is that when you have minerals, given the absence of institutions, what happens is that the gatekeeper state develops. All the politics, all the action is at the gate, and the gate is where those, the oil is. And that's why you have a lot of corruption, that's why you have a lot of economic growth that is not inclusive. So, so the point is that our economic thinking in Africa needs to begin to move away from mineral resources and to producing economic wealth, not exporting raw minerals uh, to make other countries wealthy. Because look at Nigeria. I mean, they export crude oil. Then they refine the crude oil in the UK and other countries and then send it back to Nigeria. And, you know, and who's, who's making the money? It's the guy with the refinery that is functioning that's making the money. It's not the guy who has, who has the crude oil because the prices of commodities in their raw form, are not determined by African countries. And so when the prices crash, as we've had the end of the commodity super cycle, a lot of the economies in the country go down. And the economies that have done well in the last two or three years have mostly been the economies that do not rely on minerals, mineral wealth. So I just wanted to make that comment um, that, and, and just, just, if you don't mind, just very quickly, I want to say something. I want to... Um, Forgive me if I give a plug. This book is very necessary. It's called Emerging Africa, How the Global Economy's Last Frontier Can Prosper and Matter. Here, I mean, it's just a coincidence that I wrote it. <laughs> but but <laughs> here, we dis I discuss the secret of the wealth of nations and how Africa can actually matter and prosper. So you can get it offline. It's you know online, Amazon.com, whatever. So very, I just wanted to make that point. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Good plug. <laughs> uh, my name is Adote Akwe. I'm from Togo, West Africa, but I'm now uh, in Baltimore, Maryland, American citizen. Uh, I happen to. Uh, show a book I wrote also uh, that says African Coloring and Activity Book. Uh, and I will take it from there. Um, education. Many people talk about education, you know, educating people in election, in governance, etc. We are dealing with uh, a people that uh, this said about us that we don't read a lot. Black people don't read a lot. Um, I, I agree with that because uh, I know I'm coming from a community where uh, reading is a problem. And most of the things that we are talking about here are hidden in books. How do we translate that into a vocabulary as simple as a coloring book that people can understand? That's the, one of the job I'm doing right now. And I published my first book, which is very simple, talking about knowing Africa geographically and uh, uh, culturally a little bit. It starts from there, okay? It's not a solution, a panacea, but it's a, it's a debut. Okay, now, corruption. I'm s uh, sorry, the guy that talked about election is no longer here. Uh, election observation has become a way of having, getting easy money in Africa. And in my country, Togo, how many of you know what is going on in Togo right now, West Africa? The same thing that is happening now, people asking for uh, change and democracy happened in 2005 when I was 
the president of the Human Rights League asking for the same thing uh, with the collaboration of uh, Dave Peterson sitting there, the NED. We fought on the ground. That's what took me out of the country and seeking asylum here. The same thing is happening, and the country is shut down. Internet cannot go out, cannot go in, and here we are talking about good governance and democracy in Africa. And while it is happening there, there is no more uh, human rights supporting institution like NED, NDI, Freedom House, any of them. They all pull out their program from Togo right now where the money is needed and the organization to move forward is needed. Corruption is one of the problem, and I won't come back to what uh, my colleagues and people say. So uh, last not least, we have identified a problem, a mess in the continent. Are we doing enough research to see and know what is the force behind that mess. Uh, Madam Ambassador talked about what happened in 1918 in Geneva or in Berlin when they cut the continent for a purpose. Has this finished or is it going on on another way of form? We are not addressing that problem properly. It's just like it's happening uh, you know, out of a blue. No, there is a force behind that we are not addressing. There is a force behind. So this kind of gathering and study we are doing here, my plea is let us make it an institution, not a one or two day seminar or workshop. We need a sustainable job and a right strategy because there is a force behind this mess. And as long as we ignore it, we don't address it, we will be turning around. And the little progress we have, they will steal it back. The little progress we have, we steal it back. Please, last not least, my young, beautiful sister here. The change and alternance we want at the top level, it's not because that those who are there now are not competent. If you stay long enough, you, leadership takes preparation of succession. If you linger there long enough, the day you leave, the country will be in chaos because of lack of leadership. We saw it in Cote d'Ivoire. Oufouet Boigny was the only one president. I'm not talking about he was good or he was not, no. But as soon as he died, Paul Kagame can die every day, one day. I mean, I don't, he, he can live one day. And what happened if you don't train the leader? It's better for him to stay like Mandela was alive and can talk to his successor and say, hey, do it this way, do it that way. And be a moral force behind the change. It's not because he's not good but it's because he will be a moral force to move forward. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your contributions. Thank you all for being here and for your patience and for your interest. And uh, we will have recommendations because we did listen to what was said. And um, with that, we're adjourned. Thank you, Dave, as usual. Thank you.